Okay, uh, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you're from. Very happy to be here and to see so many people join our online panel. Uh, I'd just like to take a moment to specifically thank our partners that are online here with us. So we have Schneider Electric, we have Tokyo Marine, we have Bank Lumi, Meitar Law Firm, and Altrul Shachem Benefits. Uh, and they're all taking part in this event today, so thank you. And for those who don't know me and Sosa, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to introduce myself and what we do. Uh, so I'm Daphna Meroz. Uh, I'm the VP Corporate Innovation here at Sosa. Uh, Sosa is an open innovation company. We work with multinational corporations and governments to develop and execute innovation strategies that lead to identify or partnering or implementing and investing in the right technologies. I think we all know that uh, the global pandemic has forced many industries and corporates around the world to transform their businesses and drastically refocus strategies and technologies. The panel today will bring together corporate innovation experts that will share their view on how corporate innovation has changed in the last year and what are the main challenges and how to overcome them, but also what are the opportunities that have emerged out of this crisis. Now, before we di deep dive into the discussion, I'd like to turn the mic to Guy Franklin, founder of Israeli Mapped in New York, as he gives us a brief overview of the NYC tech ecosystem. And thank you for joining us, Guy. How are you? Very good. How are you, Dafna? Good, good, good to see you. So good to Mike see you as well. You. And thank you for thank you for having me. So uh, hi everyone. And uh, um, thank you for uh, uh, Sosa for having me. Uh, and now we'll talk, I'll take you through an overview of the New York tech ecosystem. Um, if you can share the slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So I'll take you today uh, very briefly. I have like eight to 10 minutes uh, through an uh, overview of the New York tech ecosystem. So the New York tech ecosystem uh, it includes 9,000 startups and the growth started uh, in 2012 mainly when Mayor Mike Bloomberg was the mayor of New York City and they give a real boost to the New York tech ecosystem. Since then, until now, uh, more and more startups from all over the world are coming to New York as New York uh, was chosen uh, for uh, two years in a row as the number one financial center in the world. And that's why companies are deciding to relocate uh, to New York in recent years, even uh, not to the Valley. And uh, in the previous years, they came to the Valley. Now they are coming to New York uh, because of the ecosystem. As you can see, 47 out of the Fortune 500 companies are based in New York. There are 70 angel network investors in New York City with the largest one is the New York Angels with over 120 angel investors uh, in that group. There are 400 VCs and more and more, uh, I would say, uh, uh, VCs are established every year. I'm, I'm relocated from Israel to New York eight years ago. And every year I see so many VCs, so many fam new family offices, so many angel investors that are start investing and the ecosystem in New York is growing every year. Next slide. So the three uh, uh, sectors that are the strongest one uh, now in recent, uh, until the pandemic and even now, even more uh, is the first one is AI, big data in the analytics. Uh, we see uh, a, a five-year growth in AI and big data VC funding, and it's also higher in New York than it was uh, then Bay Area in Boston, which they were in the past uh, much higher than in New York City. Next slide. Life sciences. Life sciences was an area that was a little bit neglected, I would say, in New York City until recently. It was more in uh, Boston and other areas. And in uh, the last, I would say, two years, there was a real boost uh, in that uh, sector uh, in New York City. So that's also a sector that is uh, strong. And the third sector, next slide, is uh, cybersecurity, which cybersecurity is very important as, as New York City is the financial center of the world. The big banks uh, are based in New York City, the insurance companies, all the trade and the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange and all the financial world. So uh, the city of New York identify this sector as, as strong and they also uh, initiate a, a cyber NYC initiative in order to transform New York City to become a cyber capital of the world. It's a project that SOSA is involved in that as well, alongside other universities and other companies. And uh, the goal 
is to uh, bring technologies to the corporates, to the big banks, to the insurance companies, in order to uh, um, you know uh, defeat the, the the bad guys, all the ones that they want to hack and uh, 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 try to harm the, these financial institutions. Uh, so cybersecurity is very strong. More and more companies are choose New York City as their second uh, place, uh, rather uh, other next to their home country when they expand. Uh, and we see more and more companies in that sector in New York City. Uh, in a minute, we will see that in the pandemic, these companies succeed in raise money. Uh, rather than others that uh, haven't succeeded and sometimes even they shut down their operations. Next slide. So uh, uh, on March 17, Mayor de Velasio uh, said all New Yorkers should be prepared right now for the possibility of a shelter in place order. And uh, there is no doubt that uh, since that uh, date, um, I would say that uh, the startup ecosystem uh, had a hit. Uh, next slide. And uh, there is an impact on the New York tech ecosystem. So uh, next slide. So if we uh, saw until uh, the end of last year, a growth in the number of deals and number of uh, investments in terms of dollar, uh, starting Q1, actually in Q2, because Q1 still was a deal that were negotiated before the pandemic started, but we see a decline in the number uh, of deals and number of dollars. This time it was until the end of uh, Q2. We see the same trend in the Q3. This is in terms of all the 9,000 startups. But if we look in a minute, we'll see specific sectors, they raise money while the others not. Next slide. This is like a, a media, like the average uh, investment in New York City, just uh, uh, to compare it. So if it's a, med a median seed round in New York is 850K uh, compared to global uh, average of uh, almost 500. A uh, median Series say is 6 million compared to 2.7 million in uh, average, uh, global average. And uh, just uh, like, a, like an estimation of a salary of a software engineer is 98K compared to 42 uh, uh, in other places, 42K dollar. Uh, uh, next slide. And uh, the COVID-19, so the city of New York invested and partnered with startups in New York City and local manufacturers to develop face shields, gowns, bridge ventilators. And they really uh, tried to connect the tech ecosystem in New York in order to support uh, the city. That was from uh, early March uh, until now with many startups that giving their solutions to the city in order to uh, help in this crisis. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, and the area that we see that got the most hit, sorry, previous slide, is the retail, entertainment, and hospitality. There are three, almost 3,000 startups out of the 9,000 startups are in these areas. And uh, they laid, uh, laid, out of, uh, laid out employees, uh, had uh, very difficulties in these times. Um, some of them shut down their operations. On, on the other end, next slide we see an increase in, in, in terms of investments and business in cybersecurity. One example is Axonios. It's an Israeli startup in New York that raised additional $58 million during the pandemic. St. Paris, another uh, startup in New York in cybersecurity raised $40 million. And there are so many examples since then of cybersecurity startups that raised large, very large rounds from March uh, until today. Next slide. And also IPOs, for example, Lemonade, uh, an Israeli startup that was founded in Israel, expanded to New York uh, in the insurance world, went for an IPO in the middle of the pandemic, uh, early July in the New York Stock Exchange. So specific sector, sectors are thriving while others are almost dying. Next slide. And of course, digital health. All the solutions in dig digital health succeed also in raising money, for example, as you can see on the left side, TitoCare, which connects people uh, to clinicals to provide virtual home examinations and diagnosis solutions. So all the virtual uh, home doctors, uh, uh, vertical, I would say, uh, uh, succeed in raising money. This is only one example, but there are many companies in this sector that succeed raising money. Next slide. And some companies that did a pivot in their solutions in order to, uh, uh, to meet the goals of, uh, or the challenges of the, of, of the pandemic. For example, theft spot uh, can scan restaurant employees and detect pathogens to prevent uh, viral uh, illness. Next slide. 
and there are some uh, solutions that the city of New York uh, implemented. For example, contactless payments. You don't need now to come with a, with a subway card. You can uh, use your uh, phone. So that's a, a contactless payment. That's one example. Second example, next slide, is a contact tracing of Twilio, which is, a, you know, when there was a corona a virus, uh, I, would, I would say uh, someone healed and uh, you, you should uh, report and detect that's what they are doing, another, another uh, technology that they uh, implemented. And the third one, if you can uh, go to the next slide, is a symptom sensing when you go through this gate and if they identify the COVID-19 uh, symptoms. Next slide, and I got the sign that I have like uh, one minute. So on the other end, and that's only an example, as we, as we know, like New York City is like people from all over the world, startups from all over the world are coming uh, to New York City. This is one example of one community, the Israeli tech community that started, started the pandemic until now they raised the startups, raised over $1 billion, the Israeli startups in New York City. And these are the, the, the companies and the numbers. And what is interesting to see is that like 75% of them are in the cybersecurity or fintech. Fintech is also a strong sector. All the payments uh, that everyone is online today and all the different startups in the uh, fintech and payments world also succeed in raising money. So these sectors are thriving. Next slide. And also worldwide, in uh, there are 14 new unicorns only in October uh, 2020. Uh, one of them is in New York City, other uh, other the world. This is like a macro level, so we still see companies that are growing and succeeding. And uh, and, and and I think that New York in the last uh, two months, uh, although there it's people are not coming, still not coming from all over the world, we see uh, that the businesses are open. People are uh, go, uh, like started to meet again uh, face to face, starting to conduct uh, businesses. And uh, I see personally. Uh, a, a growth in deals that are signed between startups and clients and the, and the corporates and the investments that are uh, being negotiated as we speak and will be closed soon of, of additional large amounts. So we see that New York is uh, uh, starting to open again. And in the next uh, few months, uh, I predict that there will be uh, still more deals uh, and more uh, investments. Next slide. Okay, and that's the, that's the last uh, slide. Of course, the benefits, if we look for the macro level of companies are coming to New York, there is a diverse talent of uh, a diverse talent pool. It's a source of capital. That's the number one, I would say. And the second one is clients. So clients and investors, that's the most uh, two uh, most important uh, reasons companies are relocating to New York. And also it's a global center of finance, commerce, innovation, and global community of tech entrepreneurs and uh, startups. Thank you. Next slide. The end. Yes. So thank you, everyone. It was exactly 10 minutes. If you have any more questions, of course, you are welcome uh, to reach out to me. Um, thank you. And uh, without further uh, ado, I will hand the mic, the virtual mic, uh, to Tomer Shani, managing partner of uh, Meitar New York uh, Law Firm. Tomer. Thanks, Guy. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you guys are. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. As Guy mentioned, I am uh, Tomer. I am uh, the managing director of Meta New York. Meta New York is an offshoot of uh, a Meta law firm, Israel's largest uh, tech law firm, Israel's leading tech law firm. We are um, here in New York uh, to support the Israeli tech ecosystem. Um, we support many Israeli startups uh, operating out of the system, as well as uh, investors and corporate uh, um, um, bodies that, uh, that are interested in Israeli innovation. Um, today we have a, a panel of uh, three amazing speakers. Um, guys, may I please ask that you um, that you join the panel, that you open your uh, your cameras. Thank you. Um, so rather than me trying to do a poor job at introducing three excellent speakers, as I mentioned before, I would be happy to uh, hand it over to each one of them. Uh, Shilpa, do you want to say a couple of uh, words about yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Shilpa Strong, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for Tokyo Marine HCC, a specialty insurance arm of the Tokyo Marine Group. 
Uh, in my role, I lead innovation strategy and investments. I've been with the insurance industry for almost 25 years. I started on the underwriting side, uh, but spent the bulk of my career in strategy, strategic planning, finance, and business transformation. Prior to Tokyo Marine, I was with AIG for 12 years. And prior to that, uh, insurance startup. And I've also worked for reinsurers such as Swiss Re and Munich Re. Thanks. Thanks, Shilpan. Amazing. Uh, Russell? Uh, sure. So um, I'm Russ Barrett. I'm, uh, I'm the uh, CIO for uh, Bank Lumi uh, USA, so uh, for the U.S. activities of, uh, of the bank. Um, I uh, joined the bank uh, towards the end of February uh, of this year, uh, so about three weeks before that uh, quarantine that uh, was referenced in, in Guy's presentation. So a very uh, interesting time to become a CIO at a bank. Um, I, I joined the bank from uh, BNP Paribas, where I was for uh, nearly 23 years, uh, doing a lot of different things over that time. Uh, I was the CIO and then subsequently the chief operating officer for the corporate bank uh, in the Americas, um, a number of other uh, operational and client roles. And then um, before joining the bank, I was responsible for all of the change and transformation uh, of BNP Paribas in the Americas, including uh, Bank of the West, uh, where I led an internal uh, strategy practice, all of the project implementations, our artificial intelligence lab, and so on and so on. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, great to be with you all. Amazing. Uh, Bertolt? I'm Bertolt uh, Venendal. I am of Schneider Electric, where I'm SVP Innovation at the Ads. That's our uh, activity which is speaking with the outside world of startups, universities and all that. Before that, I was uh, several times country president of Schneider in several countries. Then I became uh, internal business transformation and IT transformation and then going back uh, to business where I was uh, Having our sensors, field devices, and special devices activity. And then I did a, a project in energy storage. Before that, I started at the International Atomic Energy Agency as an agency of the United Nations. Then with uh, Royal Phillips in the Netherlands, but it was never working in the Netherlands. And then 10 years, I was selling potato crisp and Pin, uh, and uh, peanuts, and there I learned the more simple the product is, the better the margin is. But that brings me that I'm still very interested in innovation. I like people who see a problem as an opportunity, and I dislike people who see not a problem as an opportunity. And last but not least, if I have to have a motto, it is uh, Andron Metron. That's to say uh, the human being is the measurement of all because in the end, it boils always down to us as human beings that we need to make it happen. And very honored to be part of this panel. So are we. Um, thank you, Bethel. And um, so as Guy mentioned, uh, these are testing times for, for, for the global economy. And while uh, the real economy is, is struggling or even clawing for breath these days, uh, as Guy uh, mentioned before, the situation within the tech community is a bit more complicated. I mean, some uh, companies have definitely been struggling. Some have had to um, re-envision themselves and even pivot and stop doing what they used to do and start doing new things. Um, but at the very same time, others have uh, actually benefited from, uh, from, from this um, health crisis that is still ranging um, and has manifested into so many other uh, forms of crisis and, 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 then, and times remain very uncertain. Um, we do know that COVID is here to stay for the foreseeable future. We hope that this foreseeable future will not be too long. I mean, like today is actually an exciting day because the first Western country is beginning the process of uh, deploying a massive, um, massive uh, um, COVID shots, uh, which is great news. But um, I believe the general assumption under which everyone is operating is that COVID is here to stay at least for a while. And for that reason, we are here today to discuss the state of corporate innovation and, and, and provide a kind of like a startup guide 
for startups that have to try and walk, to continue try and walking with corporate with corporations under those very um, testing circumstances. So I would like to start with um, a general question to the panelists, and that is how um, COVID-19 has changed the way your specific company is partnering with external technologies. And has there been any shift in the focused areas um, and the kind of companies that you that you partner with? I mean, um, Shilpa, if you can if you can get, get started, that would be amazing. Sure. Uh, thanks. So 2020 has been an interesting year, as you just mentioned. COVID is here to stay, and that crisis has brought a lot of uncertainty, though do we see a light at the end of this tunnel, right, uh, with the vaccines being rolled out. The insurance business that I belong to is a risk mitigation business, and it plays a big role in the safety of the society, helps protect wealth, reduce fear, uncertainty, stimulates growth. Uh, COVID has supercharged the digital transformation. It has accelerated the pace related to customer expectations and adopt digital adoption. We at Tokyo Marine HCC had already started on that journey ahead of COVID. We have a multi-pronged strategy and it includes partnering with external technologies where it makes sense to us in terms of either complementing or enhancing our existing landscape. The type of companies that interest us are the ones that are offering solutions that enable us to be faster, quicker, and more efficient with our customers to keep up with their expectations and other stakeholders. We like those kind of technologies, solutions, and companies. We are not looking for enterprise-wide solutions that take years to deploy. Because of COVID, we have not changed our focus in relation to the type of companies we partner with. We had already made our assessment. We were already on a journey. We had prioritized our digital uh, strategy and needs uh, because our strategy is pretty modular. We like to plug and play different components in our existing infrastructure. So we're constantly scanning the insurtech landscape and other solutions for nimble solutions. We do a quick build and buy versus assessment and look for technologies that can easily be assimilated in, into our framework. So what has only probably changed is the pace at which we are moving forward. So picking up on that, Chilpa, before we turn to other speakers, um, would it be fair to say that uh, the human attention, the personal attention to innovation uh, has changed during uh, COVID times, perhaps? Um, on the one hand, there was less uh, focus on innovation because um, uh, companies, and, and, and obviously Tokyo Marine could be an exception to that, but, but we're in a kind of like a survival mode rather than innovative, world, uh, innovative mode, or um, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the need to look for uh, new solutions was, uh, was actually stronger during that time. Right. A couple of things. So people have been on the innovation journey, some doing a, a real work and some just kind of tagging along over the last five to seven years. But clearly, COVID has changed the game. So I recently saw a little cartoon that says, who has, uh, who has, one person that is a driving change today, CEO, CTO, and there's a little, you know, the little virus, you know, sitting there and, you know, you tick mark the virus. No, but I do need to be fair in terms of, there have been companies that have really stepped on the gas over the last couple of years, but I'm telling you this, this innovation has really picked up and people are paying a lot of attention because suddenly overnight you had to work remote and people who were not prepared were scrambling. So, got it. Before I turn to Russ, I would like to um, to invite our participants. Are quite we have quite quite many actually. I mean, to to ask questions um, at the end of uh, this panel, we will have a ten minute Q and A session. So please uh, feel free to share any questions you may have with us uh, before. I mean, like as we as we go along, uh, Russ. Before I, I mean, I, I would like to address the same question and also. Um, say a couple of words about, a, 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 by way of advice, what would be the best way to get the attention of the right people within Bank Lumia under the present challenging circumstances? Because obviously the reality is not the same as it used to be until uh, March 2020. I mean, obviously yeah. you, you would need to employ different, um, different means to get the attention of the right people within the bank. Sure, so um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll start to answer that, that piece real quick, not email. 
I, I think that's the, uh, the, the, the one way I, I'm positive, at least for me uh, personally, it's the, it's the worst way to contact me, even for people who, who work with me in the bank. Uh, it's, it's become a, a terrible way. Um, I, I'll come back to, to maybe the best way to connect. Um, one thing that has been very interesting with COVID is um, specifically with the outreach to the external marketplace startup and even more uh, mature technologies. Um, two things have emerged. Number one, um, you know, it, it has become uh, very difficult uh, in a COVID environment for us to adapt the way we network uh, and the way that we uh, socialize and meet people and engage and just have more happenstance interactions. So uh, it is certainly not advantageous, I think, for uh, startups and for uh, emerging technologies uh, because the introduction and the natural flow of networking is is been disrupted. Um, I think it's normalizing a little bit, but it's uh, it certainly had its pain points. On the other side of the equation, uh, and totally on the flip side, uh, especially in the commercial banking uh, domain in which uh, Bank Lumi in the USA primarily operates, um, what we've seen is is a fundamental shift towards digital amongst a client base that has traditionally uh, been operating in more boutique relationship centric activities. Uh, and we saw this in the way that the government stimulus was administered with the PPP program and what banks needed to do to ramp up volume electronically and digitally and what that forced banks to do in terms of being able to manage through their legacy. So as a result on one side, um, we, we are, I would say a lot less uh, in discovery mode uh, but on the other side, we're actually hunting down and tracking down more startups than we've ever done uh, to be able to solve the problems that are coming at us at a fast clip. Um, the best way to contact, well, first and foremost, I could say at least for uh, commercial banks or, or large corporate banks, uh, if you're solving the problem around uh, data, if you're solving the problem around credit, uh, and uh, you're solving the problem around digital experiences for clients, uh, I'm sure we'll track you down um, and we will have an opportunity to discuss uh, outside of that. And notably, I also think about cybersecurity. Um, you know, I think I, I find there's there's some vehicles that have become better just from a selling perspective than others. LinkedIn uh, is certainly a much better vehicle, I think, uh, for me than any other uh, reach out, either phone, email or traditional uh, outweigh. I think it's a little bit more personal, a little bit more individual, and we could do a little bit more research before engaging. So that would be my uh, long-winded answer uh, to, to the question. A great one, actually. Uh, Bethold, what, uh, what, what would be the best way to get, um, to get the attention of uh, Schneider and Electric? And, and, and again, I would ask the same general question to you. I mean, like, what, what are you guys, what, what is uh, uh, Schneider Electric focused on these days? Well, first of all, I think it is a very smart and intelligent question, not to say a good question. I think that besides maturity and disruptiveness of the technology of the startup, that is what catches my eyes. Do they have a deep understanding of the customer pain point? That I cannot repeat enough and enough. Start please with the customer pain points. That is for us the point which, if somebody comes with a very short description of the customer pain points and then gives a solution, then I get excited about it. Uh, and then we can together work how we can make this happen. If uh, somebody comes to me with a real good solution, technically, but only technically, but has not the customer pain point, then I call it happy engineering very nice intellectually, but we will say, no, this we cannot do. Especially today, it is important that the innovation starts from the customer. Okay, um, and can you say a couple of words about, um, about what challenges, what challenges COVID-19 brought to the way you typically work with, with startups? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, we continued nearly all our POCs, not to say all, that didn't change, only we had to prioritize because certain became much more, uh, let's say, urgent at the moment, so we had to prioritize them. 
others became a little bit less urgent, but the real challenge was for us, a POC means that we have to go into a plant for us to start it. And since security for our employees, but also for the startups going into the plant was very important. At certain times, we had really to do miraculous things in order to make that happen. But in the end, we are on uh, track with all the POCs which we have planned. Okay, but thank you, Basel. Especially at the beginning. But... Um, and by the way, I understand that some people are having difficulties um, um, hearing you. So if you could please move your uh, mic a little bit for the next uh, for the next question. I will do that. I, I think it's better now. Uh, okay. Thank you for that. Um, Russell, I mean, Russell, with you, I would like to focus on um, the way to overcome typical challenges that COVID presents for interaction between uh, corporations and, uh, and startups. And what, what, um, what do you guys do to continue um, and, and, and to maybe even improve and enhance your uh, interaction with startups? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, and, and Shilpa, I think, touched upon it. I mean, if, if, if the startup is solving a problem or can potentially address uh, one of the, the, the real um, strategic priorities that we have without, um, you know, invoking a multi-year or, uh, you know, the traditional um, replacement of legacy, I, I think that's where the conversation sweet spot is right now. Um, trying to figure out how uh, by moving forward strategically and, and you know, and, and towards your target architecture, there are opportunistic ways to solve some, some really clear, quick wins. Um, certainly for uh, a number of um, platforms and cloud platforms that are becoming more standardized across enterprises, um, I see startups being very successful at solving, um, you know, enterprise problems that those uh, platforms either traversing across those platforms or even operating within them. Um, I saw in Guy's presentation uh, earlier, he had uh, own backup. That's a perfect example off of uh, primarily Salesforce uh, of a startup that I think is uh, uniquely and differentiating and solving their problem. And even to my earlier point, I mean, we're reaching out to them um, and, and seeking them out because we're experiencing these pain points and in investigating in the marketplace uh, who's well positioned to solve it. Um, there are a little bit more complex or more structural types of challenges that uh, most banks are, are really kind of facing right now. Um, again, these tend to have much longer uh, sales cycles and change management cycles. The ones where I think we're having a lot of success during COVID uh, is quick win, expedited third party risk, you know, onboarding type of uh, capabilities for the startup, especially when working with highly regulated firms, um, you know, startups that are ready to be able to work with enterprise um, and they are able to solve a problem in a short period of time, I think are doing very, very well, at least from the lens I'm looking at, um, much more so even than the, the longer term or more strategic uh, architecture place. Do you have any specific examples? Um, you know, I mean, without getting into company names, I think we've had a couple Not of, names, but technology. Yeah, I think that, in yeah. cybersecurity, um, there's a few um, areas around, um, you know, incident and, and, and log management. We've seen a number of opportunities there. Uh, data management and, and certainly being able to organize and structure uh, data in the cloud. This is obviously a very significant uh, stress point uh, for, for banks who are moving more and more out of captive data centers. Um, and need to be able to secure and manage those. I think you'll see uh, all of the, the cyber uh, activities around that, as well as even the general data management um, and uh, data science and data decisioning aspect around that is, is very attractive uh, for banks, uh, notably Bank Lumi USA. Okay. Shilpa, any specific examples for uh, problems that you have been able to solve or that you're on the, um, the, on the way to resolving during COVID times through interaction with, with startups that started during COVID time? Um, really, um, what, what has happened is it has forced us, right? COVID has forced us to kind of adapt and adopt new ways of working and doing business. In the past, we would do a lot more of in-person and now it's shifted to video conferencing with the startups. Um, a, a lot many times 
um, we, we did in-person visits that gave us that personal touch a greater, deeper understanding. Uh, I don't think the level of interaction has changed. What just has happened is the frequency has increased. It hasn't posed a real challenge per se. Uh, we've used POCs as uh, you know, others have mentioned and Russell has just uh, mentioned in terms of seeking out companies. Uh, we do that, there are different entry points you know, to an organization, but we do actively look out as we've done. We know exactly where there are gaps in our, in our solutioning and we do seek out startups. Uh, it's just that we've done it more on video conferencing. We have actually done a full POC prototyping during COVID times and it has worked very well, all remote. You know, so um, we've overcome the challenges. I haven't found it particularly cumbersome at all um, in trying to move forward during this time. So I, I was going to ask, I mean, you, you know, in the past, we used to say that the face-to-face -face meeting is the key for a successful interaction with, um, with, with, with a corporate body, with, with a corporation. Um, you mentioned that um, the need to go online didn't um, didn't really change that, that, that didn't really change that much. But um, do you really not find the interaction online, the interaction through Zoom or other um, other media forms, uh, any different from um, from a good opportunity to um, to meet face to face, to shake hands, to look at each other eyes? I mean, like to to try and read the room better. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you really think that the results and the interactions are exactly the same? Uh, well, let me just uh, you know, take a little step back, right? There's something to be said about face-to-face -face like you just said. There is, you're never going to fully replace the need for face-to-face -face and the personal connection that's created. However, um, there are, you know, um, it's, it, nothing has come to a grinding halt. Video conferencing has worked very well. This is all coming from a person who's to be on, on plane 70 to 80 times a year, right? <laughs> In all my various roles, I used to live on the plane. Uh, I do miss the personal interaction, uh, especially when there are new relationships being built. Uh, to maintain old relationships is easier. And I think that's what we've done over the last eight to nine months. Um, video conferencing, you know, um, there is an ease of communication. People are more accessible. Uh, it tends to get, you do miss the small nuances. Um, as we move forward, since you said it, Tomar, that COVID is here to stay, we've got to figure out a mixed, we need to mix and match the different channels of communication, I think, um, and, and figure out, because face-to-face -face channels will always be, be, be disrupted in the, in the near term, I think. Um, COVID is not going to be eradicated overnight. So we'll have to figure out new ways of working and mixing and matching these channels. Video conferencing has worked. It, it is a, it's a great placeholder. It's a great alternative. Uh, but I do believe in face-to-face in, in, -face in certain situations. Um, so um, again, I mean, I'm not going to be traveling as much. I'm going to be traveling when necessary, my personal experience. I'm going to be using more video, uh, video conferencing. But when it comes to building new relationships, I am going to show up <laughs> at people's doorstep, you know, to talk and shake hands and yeah. have a cup of coffee, have have dinner, and 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 that's not going to go away. Yeah, my, my personal view of the world, and I'm going to say it with a grain of salt, is that uh, COVID has accelerated certain uh, certain processes that were already in place. I mean, like the world was moving towards more and more uh, remote interaction, uh, which is challenging in a way, but also a good thing. I mean, like obviously uh, we do realize these days that uh, a lot of travel that we used to undertake pre-COVID was mm -hmm. unnecessary. This is definitely not bad for the environment and for um, uh, other purposes. I mean, I, I, I believe that once um, we start forgetting about COVID, whenever that happens, uh, we will be traveling a bit less, we will be interacting a bit more remotely, but I, I, I personally totally agree that um, um, nothing beats the personal interaction and the face-to-face -face, uh, uh, meetings. Uh, Bethel, I wanted to ask you a more specific questions about PLCs in COVID times. I mean, how has uh, COVID affected your ability and, and, and your practicalities in connection with POCs with startups? 
I mean, would you say that you have done more of this, less of this? Um, is your appetite to, uh, to doing PLCs with startups um, greater than it used to be before COVID, the same, whatever? Okay, a difficult but a good question. First of all, I have to say that certain POCs we have accelerated because there was a real urgency to do them. Others we have put a little bit on the back burner because they are were less urgent, but also, as I said before, in certain uh, cases since uh, we are working especially in the industrial business we want to test those customer solutions in our plants first and in certain uh, plants it was nearly impossible to go in there because we have uh, most important is to secure this, uh, the healthy situation of our workforce what it is but I have to say that uh, uh, we as a corporation have become a little bit more uh, demanding about the threshold when we go to uh, POC. Huh? And really, we are uh, going there when the customer pain point is very clear uh, described, as I said before. Uh, that is for us the most important, and especially in today's world where also our customers, the first uh, objective is this to keep running and to make that more efficient. So they will only go to innovations which can solve that today. Uh, innovations which are more on the long term, they are interested in, but not today. So it is very important, once again, that the startup, and also in a way working with us, very clearly describes which customer pain point they are trying to solve. And then they speak about the technology and not the other way around. Then I have to say also that our PRCs are meant, of course, to test early uh, technology. But once again, this early technology, it is important that they solve a customer pain point. Because as we said before, happy engineering is nice, but especially now, eh, we have no time for that. And also our customers not. Got it. Okay, at this point, I want to um, um, open this uh, session for a Q&A, um, open this discussion for a Q&A session, and we do have quite a few uh, questions from, um, from our participants, and I do apologize in advance that we may not be able to get through all of them in 10 minutes, but we will try. Um, the first question I want to ask is actually a good follow-up question on, 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 your, uh, um, on your last comments, uh, Basil. Uh, and that is what is the average duration from the initial contact with, with relevant executive until a POC or pilot starts? Oh, that can be, I have seen one week to uh, two months and the two months was due to uh, COVID because although everything was ready, we couldn't do it. We have a policy in our company that we know that as a big company, we need to be agile. We will not be as fast and as flexible as uh, our startups, but we really try to do that every time. So for us at the moment that we think the technology solves a customer uh, pain point, I hope you can hear me because one tells me my connection is unstable. Then we speak directly well. uh, with, mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, interested division they come back to us and then we go as fast as possible. And it's, I have seen uh, POLs uh, since we started in one week and others two months. Because anyway, we know what is for the startup uh, today huh, is really today. And for us, that is uh, in one week and that's already too uh, slow. So we are doing everything that at the moment we believe it is solving a customer uh, issue that we go fast because that we owe to the startups. Shop, I see you are nodding quite, um, <laughs> quite enthusiastically. Do you agree? I do agree, right? You've got to be quick. Um, and traditionally in our industry, in, in the insurance industry, um, POCs weren't popular. So um, the, key, the key is not just the starting of the POC, but the key is the duration of the POC. A POC can't be more than four to six weeks. I've seen people wanting to do it over months. Again, it depends on the complexity of the problem that you're trying to solve. 
So the whole point of all the POC is also to take a few hypotheses and test them out really quickly. So I do believe that you've got to be agile, you've got to get to it quickly. And uh, the, most, the most important thing is customer need. I've seen many times the front runner in short tech, in my experience, have lost the deal with us because they didn't listen to what we wanted. Um, even the product was comparable to the other, other in, in short tech and they were the front runners, but last minute, because the passion and wanting to sell their solution, their technology versus what the buyer and the customer wants. So I would caution everybody that listen and, and what Bartol says, it's important to align your product with what the customer needs. And it may not be in the same format that you may be thinking as an entrepreneur or a startup. It could, and you've got to be flexible. You've got to be adaptable. You know, you've got to figure out uh, and tailor it a little bit and uh, meet the customer needs and listen and listen and listen to what people are asking for. And uh, be quick to do the POCs and work with the, with the companies to, to, to get it done, so. Tomer, if you allow me, I would like to sure. add to that. It is also important when we do the POC, when we have the results, that we look in each other's eyes and clearly take the decisions. In certain times, the POC didn't, and that's the reason we are doing it, answer to the need. But then we need to be honest enough to say this to each other in order not to waste the time of both parties. Eh? Listen uh, to each other, perhaps we can change it, but if it is for whatever reason of possible, we owe that to be honest with each other and to tell that because a POC which doesn't work with us doesn't mean it can work with somebody else, but for our customers, it doesn't work. So it is not only the speed of starting a POC, the speed of doing it, but also to draw the conclusions. Okay, interesting. Russ, I mean, is it any different with Lumi? I mean, can you guys afford to be quicker than, um, than, 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 than you know, other um, you know, I, I think we're quick for banks, but I don't think banks are quick. So uh, that's probably the best way I would say it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself less inclined to do POCs and, and more inclined to uh, you know, uh, create an attractive commercial arrangement that allows, you know, both parties the maximum amount of flexibility. But I, I find it's very and increasingly difficult to uh, to garner the right attention from a startup partner unless there's a, a more explicit financial incentive, especially because of the nature and how many of them are are, are operating with less funding than maybe uh, traditionally uh, they were. Um, so, so I find it's better to work in more intentional uh, ways rather than more speculative ways. But again, that's me as a CIO, whereas uh, my fellow panelists maybe have a little bit more flexibility. No, I do agree. Uh, if, I can, if I may just add, one way that we, uh, we've figured out is we actually, because, you know, funding could be an issue, we do compensate um, and we work out. A, you know, cost for the POC and we, we do compensate the startups, um, you know, for their efforts. So, um, or insure techs for their efforts. So um, that way, you know, um, if, it, if it works, we, we, we leverage that to take it into production, so. Okay, another question that I wanted to ask you, Ras, is uh, what if any uh, of the recent shifts in innovation, uh, in innovation focus, uh, do you think will stay past COVID? Uh, two, I think will definitely stay. One, people will work outside of your uh, headquarters and office more uh, than than they were. I don't think that will. Um, I don't think it will stay the way it is, uh, or as extreme as the way it is. I think there will be a need for people to be face to face, and uh, I guess I'm very old school in that regard. I, I would like to see my colleagues and 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 my partners face to face. I I do, however, think that. Uh, the recipe for remote working will change uh, sustainably. And I also think the shift for um, clients and customers of a banking institution and their willingness uh, to do more complex transactions digitally um, will also be a permanent shift. Um, and, and while I think relationships matter more than ever uh, in, in banking and many other sectors, I, I believe that the digital experiences that clients will expect uh, there's no turning back because uh, there were things done during this period that were just too easy 
too flexible and, and, and too powerful for people to ever go back. Okay, Shoba, do you agree? Or do yeah. you have any other insights? Oh, no, I totally agree. It's, it's very similar. Uh, insurance is such a people's and relationship-based business, but we survived and it's going to be a mixed model. Um, you know, it'll also depend on the job type and the level of the organization, how much of a remote versus in-person will happen. Uh, but clearly uh, it won't be as extreme like Russell says, as it is right now, or it used to be in the past. So we want to move towards a very balanced uh, way of doing business going forward. Got it. Okay, we have time for one final question that I actually want to ask each one of you. And this is a point we did touch upon before, um, but, 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 but this is a kind of like a more direct question that, that they do want to raise. And that is, what is the, um, um, sorry, um, I mean, I, w w one of our uh, participants says that uh, our tech startup uh, startups have uh, found it hard to know how to approach corporates uh, for, for a new connection during COVID. We did touch upon it before. Uh, what advice can you give, uh, can give on what the best front, uh, front door is now? Um, so I know we touched upon it, but uh, in one sentence, uh, I, again, I'm gonna, can you try, can each one of you try and provide our participants, our startup participants with um, a helpful piece of advice? Uh, I want to approach a, a corporation. What is the best way to do it these days? Um, Bathel, if you, you know, if you can share your, 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 your thoughts first, it would be great. Okay, you are not nice with me. So, because this is a very, complex and very good question. Now, first of all, I would like to say, and that's more in general, hang on there and believe in yourself. Then secondly, to come to your question, which is quite precise, how to connect me. Yeah? Connect me, we have now all those means. It is not, uh, we have phones still. We have mail. I know that my dear colleague from uh, Lumi Bank doesn't like that, but I still like mails because they are very precise. And we have social media. So we have, personally, I have a little bit of difficulty with because there are so many and you have to open them all. So that's it is. Then, like in the good old days, uh, if you have relations already in our company, tell them that they contact me and we will contact you. But it is, like always in life, uh, you have to use all the channels you think are useful. And that is even today more important than before. But... Normally, we have a policy that every channel where you go, we should uh, recontact you in 48 hours, at least. Uh, so simply try it uh, and you will get an answer. Sorry, it is perhaps not the answer everyone hoped, uh, but it no, is the that's reality. A, that's a fair answer. Uh, Ras, your point is yeah, I guess I'm going to admit that I am, uh, I'm, I'm far less responsible in general than Bertolt. I, 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 uh, I, I think there's... Um, it's a very uh, harsh, uh, you know, environment. That's the reason why I think, um, you know, successful startups is uh, is 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 a, is a very uh, tricky and and at times uh, asymmetrical journey. Um, I, I think the ones that I've had the most successful um, in, in the past in working with and in discovering, um, two things stand out to me. Number one, uh, these are uh, startups that the very problem they set out to solve. Uh, is very much aligned to the problem that I am facing. I think that sounds very easy, but one of the things that is very interesting for me is how many times there are people who reach out, which I think creates some of that traffic jam, uh, who are coming in problems that absolutely would not be faced by not just Bank Lumi USA, but any bank, uh, period. So it creates a lot of traffic, a lot of noise, uh, and therefore maybe uh, convolutes uh, the ones who are really kind of trying to solve a, a direct problem. Um, the, the second piece, which is um, equally important, which is uh, when the, the problem that you're looking to solve is being faced, uh, demonstrating an understanding of the particular sector or the particular. So getting not just into the segment or the, uh, or, or the area that you're looking to sell, but really understanding uh, what would be the consistency. Because again, when you're talking to banks, and I would imagine the same with insurers, um, you're probably going to see an incredible overlap uh, architecturally uh, for an overwhelming number of the firms. Being able to show how the problem differentiates from your existing set, I think is a very important dimension. And then again, for me, finding the right channel 
Uh, for some people, clearly it's still email. For others, it's LinkedIn. Um, I think phone is becoming more and more challenging. But um, you know, for me, I think LinkedIn is very uh, important, and 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 the introductory message being very explicit about the problem you're looking to solve uh, is 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 very helpful. Uh, and then the last piece is demonstrating your understanding of the environment that you would need to navigate to become onboarded as a partner. Th those would be the other things. Thank you, Russ. Um, Shilpa, we, we were out of time, but uh, one final sentence. Now just quickly, I agree with all of the above that they have said, but definitely leverage relationships because every organization has a different entry point. Startups work with VCs. You know, they have the networks, accelerators, different conferences, you know, leverage all of that. Because I do tend to, as, as, as a consumer, I do tend to reach out to my contacts within, um, you know, within these different organizations. And I do tend to focus a little bit more in terms of what they have to offer. But at the end of the day, it's, my, it's our need and what they have to offer. There's gotta be alignment. Thank you. I think it's been a very interesting, actually a fascinating discussion. Uh, Daphna, I would like to invite you for uh, a couple of concluding remarks. Uh, thanks everyone. And uh, we hope to see you soon uh, in person. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've come to the end of this great session. And uh, thank you again, Russell, Shilpa, Bartol, Tomer and Guy for being with us today and for sharing your insights with us. I'd also like to thank Altura Shacham Benefits for partnering with us on this event. Uh, I want to thank everyone that joined our online panel for your time today. I, I hope you found this interesting and useful. And uh, please feel free to contact me directly if you'd like to learn more about SOSA and if you have any questions. I hope you have a great day and most importantly, stay so safe and healthy. So thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.